I uh, start recording. Okay. So uh, let me open here the uh, information I gather. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have uh, Professor Altair, uh, uh, our recent hiring here at uh, UFO. Uh, he, he got his major in astronomy at uh, UFRJ in Rio de Janeiro uh, between 2008 and 2012. Got his master's also at uh, UFRJ 2012 to 2014, and his PhD also at uh, UFRJ from 2014 to 2018. And he did a, a short postdoc at UNESP in 2018, and a longer one at the National Observatory in Brazil from 2018 to 2022. And as I said, he's a recent uh, hire here in. Uh, in our institute at UFU, and today he's going to talk about the study of transneptunian objects by stellar occultations. So, uh, Professor Altair, the uh, microphone is yours. Uh, thank you very much for accepting the invitation to uh, talk to us. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I cannot see everyone, but uh, I don't know if you I know much of uh, what I'm talking about. I, I made a presentation uh, like you don't know much. So I'm sorry if that's a very basic subject. Okay, so my work is mainly focused on the study of transatonia objects by stellar quotations. I made a, a slide here to talk about me. To, just, uh, but uh, George, I just uh, talk. Well, my full uh, degree was made at UFRJ uh, in Rio de Janeiro. I studied astronomy all my, all my formation. So I didn't do physics by itself, but uh, I did a lot of class in physics. I also stayed one year in Paris Observatory to work with object determination of natural satellites. My postdoc, I only post here the, the major one was at UNESCO Latinata, where I studied satellites and rings from observations made by spacecraft, mainly Cassini. And since uh, last month, I am a professor at, uh, here at UFU. Uh, in my, all my work, I published or collaborated in 35 publications, being six by uh, as, first, as first author. I have one paper uh, accepted and one submitted at uh, the moment. Okay, my presentation is divided like this. I will start, start talking about the transnetunion objects, explaining what, what they are, and, uh, what, why we are studying these objects, then about the technique, the stellar occultation, my team that, that, that I collaborate the most, the Dark Star, the main results that we obtain using this technique, and then I'll finish it with, I'm working at the moment with this package, Python package soil, and cell locations by space telescopes. So first, what are the transnetunion objects? What they call TNOs, these objects are those located after the optic of Neptune. So I have here in this plot, distance in astronomical units and inclination from the from the Earth orbit. So we have here the distance from Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and all those objects after of the orbit of Neptune are called TNOs. Uh, this includes Pluto, for instance. These objects are very interesting because they are very far from the, from the Sun, so they suffer less space weathering. So their characteristics are remaining from the uh, solar system formation. They are considered fossils of the solar system. And because of the distance and they are very small, they are discovered mainly since 1992. The first one, obviously, was Pluto, discovered in 1927, but then the second one was discovered only in 1992. And up till now, we have uh, about 3,000 uh, objects discovered but we expect to have uh, much more than that. 
So, because the distance and the size, they are very difficult in observing by usual techniques, like uh, direct observations, because they are very faint, like they, they reflect the light of the sun, so and they are usually very dark. So, the light reflected is very, uh, is very low, so it's very difficult to observe. But not only these objects it by themselves that we study, there are other objects of interest. For instance, the centaurs, there are those asteroid-like objects that orbit the sun between Jupiter and Neptune. These regions are very unstable because of the planets, so they, not, they do not remain here for a long time. So if they do not remain for a long time, where do they come? The, the more, the, the models should suggest they are probably TNOs that for interactions with Neptune, they were brought to this inner region. And after some time, they will interact with the other planets and then uh, send to, uh, to it, the outer solar system, uh, scattered, or probably become a Jupiter comet. Uh, because of this, they are considered as a representative of the TNO population. They are closer to us, they, they are easier to study. The Triton, which is this Neptune satellite, uh, we also believe, because of the optic characteristics, that it was captured as well by Neptune, so it was formed as elsewhere, probably uh, TNO as, as well, and then by some interactions with Neptune, it was captured in a very close orbit, so like a satellite. Ceres. Ceres is uh, an asteroid located in the main belt of asteroids between Mars and Jupiter. But some observations made by some spacecraft made uh, in local, they suggest as well that Ceres it has a surface that is covered by material coming from the outer uh, solar system. So we believe as well there are some models that suggest the series was captured uh, or oh, sent to the inner region of the solar system by some interactions with the planets. The Hegla satellites, which are satellites from the main, from the uh, large planets like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. They orbit these planets from far distance. They have larger eccentricities and inclinations. So they are believed as well to be captured from the, from the, other, from the other regions. But in this case, they are mainly probably coming from the main belt of asteroids for the Jovian irregular satellites. But for the satellites of Neptune, probably they were captured from the TNO population. So all these objects are of interest for our work since they can suggest uh, something about the evolution formation of the solar system if you can characterize them properly. Okay, so this is what I, uh, I just talked about, uh, why they are interest because they are forces of the solar system and how we will study them since they are very difficult to observe. We will use the Stellar technique, stellar occultation technique, so we can characterize the TNOs, uh, like the sizes and densities, so we can study the distributions of sizes and masses uh, of these populations to understand the evolution, like the uh, collisional evolution over time. And also to study the surface physical properties. But this will be more clear when we talk about the technique itself. Okay, so what is a stellar occultation? A stellar occultation consists in a temporary disappearance of, can be total or partial, of the star due to the passage of a solar system body as seen by an observer. So if I'm looking to the star, uh, there will be an object of the solar system passing in front of this star. And when once it, uh, it passes front, we cannot see the star anymore, so you have a drop in brightness. So if you talk about this, we can imagine it, what we already know, which is the solar eclipse. In the case of the solar eclipse, we have the sun, the moon, and earth. 
the light of the star is blocked by the moon, and in moon region of the of Earth, we cannot see the sun anymore because it's blocked by the moon. So you, the sun will, will cast a shadow over Earth because of the moon, and we have this region. The if we are in this place, we cannot see the sun, so we call this Umbra. And in another region that we can see the sun as partially blocked by the moon, and this region is called Penumbra. So what we work is similar to this, but instead of the sun, we have a star, and instead of the moon, we have uh, any other solar, uh, solar system body. In this case, we have a star that is very far, so we can imagine that the light come to us like a plane wavefront or like a many uh, photons, like they are perpendicular to each other in that direction. So when this light is blocked by a solar system body, you cast a shadow over Earth that has about the same size of the body. So the technique consists in measuring the size of the shadow. We do not need to see the body itself. We only need to see that the body will pass in front of the star. So you look into the star, you see a magnitude drop. So this object is moving uh, in its orbit. When it does, you cast a shadow on Earth. The shadow will move over Earth. Uh, like like this. So each point in this map is the center of the shadow separated by one minute. So we can see that in this case, the occultation will last for about uh, 10 minutes over Earth. The shadow will have about uh, the same size of the body. So we, you can imagine at this instant, you have a circle over here. Then in this minute, a circle over here. And we our observer in this region will look to the star and see that it will be blocked by the, by, in this case, by Triton, which is a satellite of, of Neutron, during uh, over a time. If we closer to the center of the shadow, this duration that the magnitude of the, the, the star will disappear, it will be larger than if we closer to the limit of the shadow. This other one is an occultation by Phoebe, which is a regular satellite of Saturn. It, it is about 200 kilometers, so the size of the shadow will have about the same size, 200 kilometers. So we can see that it's very difficult to observe these occultations by small objects because the shadow will be very small. So we need to have the position of the object in the solar system known with very great, uh, with great accuracy. And this is easier for larger bodies. So this is what we observe. If we look into the star, in this case, an occultation by this TNO 2010-EK-139. This was observed uh, by our group at the telescope located in Chile, SOAR, in 2018. So what we have here is this star that will be blocked. We measure the light for in each image. We make images with very small uh, exposure time. And then we combine many observations to measure the flux of the star over time. So we have a, with what you call a light, a light curve. So measure the light of this star. You see that in a moment, it will be blocked by the object and it will disappear. And then after some seconds, the object will, will be off, so we can see the star again. So this is what we observe. When we do this by many observations, oh, sorry, uh, before that. So what we can do when we observe, it depends, uh, the, the characteristic of the light curve will depend on the characteristics of the body. So in that case, when we saw the light curve, it, it was only a square box uh, that we can say about this uh, drop, the, about the light curve. It was very quick drop and then a quick, what you call, immersion. 
But if we an occultation by, by a planet, the planet has rings, the planet has atmosphere, the planet may have uh, satellites. So everything that will block the light will make some characteristics, some presence in the light curve. So in this case, if you have this planet, you pass in front of this star, what you see is a quick drop and faster caused by the ring material. These drops can characterize by the, by the duration, the size of the ring, and by the quantity of light dropped, the, the density of the ring, uh, the opacity, for instance. So in this case, we have a quick drop, but a very dense ring. Here we have a larger drop, but a not so dense ring, and many other drops uh, that can be seen here. If it is a ring, uh, a real ring, so it is symmetric, so you have drops in, uh, in one side of the body and then other drops in the other side. Once the star uh, is being blocked by the planet itself, we have atmosphere. So if it, the body has an atmosphere, the light of the star will not be uh, fully blocked. So we will have a uh, refraction caused by the atmosphere. So the drop will be smooth. Like we have uh, that over many images, we have the, this drop caused by the diffraction, the, so, a refraction of the light, refraction of the atmosphere. Depending on the characteristic of the atmosphere as well, we can see some spikes given the variation in density in the atmosphere, caused by variation temperature and pressure, etc., or clouds, maybe. So everything that can be in the atmosphere will cause effects in the light curve. Also, if this side of the planet is day or night, if this side of the planet is in winter or summer, all of this interferes. Uh, it's uh, important in the analysis of the atmosphere, atmosphere structure. Okay, so if the occultation is central, meaning the, the center of the planet will occult the star, the refraction caused by all the atmosphere in all directions will make like a lens and all these will converge to the center of the, of the projection. And we can have an increase in, the, in light caused by the, all this uh, integrated uh, refraction. This we call a central flash. And this is important because in this case, you can study the lower atmosphere while in the drop or the immersion, we study the upper atmosphere of the body. When we have many observations uh, located in different longitude, longitudes and latitudes of, on Earth, we, uh, each observation will make different, uh, obtain different light curves. So in this case, it's an observation by series observed here in Brazil. Uh, this was observed near Belo Horizonte, so it is a small drop. Uh, it's very quick compared to this one observed in Itajubá. We have also an observation in Impi and another in Ponta Grossa, Paraná. So, the same way that we can project the shadow of the body on Earth, when we observe, we can redo this uh, projection and pinpoint the position of the body uh, on space. So, we project the exact position and in instant when we have the the immersion and the immersion of the light curves on space, and we can have this, like these points spread in the projection plane. Depending on the uncertainty that we have, we can have a, a larger error in the position or a smaller one. What we do is convert the uncertainty in time that we abstain from the observations in the uncertainty on space. We also had uh, in Santa Catarina an observation that we call a negative one, 
because uh, it was outside of the shadow, so we didn't observe the magnitude drop of the star. But these observations are also important because if we, we didn't have this in Ponta Grossa, we could use these uh, observations of Catarina to limit it, the size of the body. So you can see here that using these projections, we can constrain the size of series, for instance. I put uh, this uh, here. Uh, it's a detail the, about the light curve because I know that there is a lot of people that work in optics in this group. So what, since we have a light that is blocked by somebody, we have diffraction as well. And in this case, we have a laboratory to study diffraction patterns in a large scale. So we can see, for instance, in this case, uh, for instance, an observation that will be central, an observation that will be close to the limb, and a negative observation, the number here, one to four. And we see here what would be the light curve observed if it had time resolution enough to observe the diffraction pattern. So we have this kind of observations. And we can see here that it, this diffraction pattern are measured in kilometers. So it's very, it's very large compared to what we do in the laboratory. So this is just to, to show what we can do. If you, if you have questions, you can ask me at the moment. Okay. So doesn't need to wait at the, the end of the presentation. Okay, so continue. So given all that, the stellar position technique is very powerful to measure uh, characteristics of the body, but we need a uh, very good positions for the body and the star. So we can- um, Altair, Altair, we have someone wrote a question here. I don't know if you can see uh, slide 11. Could this peak in the center of the occultation graph be caused by diffraction and airy pattern, for example? Yeah, I think okay. that's exactly the case, right? I don't know. No, no, this, this is not, this peak that we see here is not a diffraction. Of course, there is uh, the airy, airy pattern, like we should see here, but it's much small. It's very, it's very small. Usually, you depend on the on the on the observation, the the, the uh, sorry, the, the conditions of the observation. But usually, we cannot see because it's very very small, and very quick. If you had enough resolution, we could see the area pattern as well. But this one that I show here is caused by the uh, refraction. Is the refraction of the atmosphere that converge to the center of the of the projection. Okay. I will show later uh, a video of this kind of observation that will be clear that it's not the airy pattern. Okay, so continue the condition of the observation. So we need very good positions for the object and for the star, so we can know exactly where the shadow will pass. In the case of the stars, we already have very good positions because uh, in 2015, there was a satellite named Gaia that was uh, launched to observe the full sky and to obtain, uh, the, to, to map the sky and obtain very good positions. And so compared to the positions of the objects, the news, the stars uh, do not present any problem in their positions anymore. Some time ago, uh, before 2015, the, pos the error in the positions of stars and the objects in the solar system were, were about the same size. So, uh, the orbits of TNOs in, in nowadays are, the, uh, are poorly known, so this is the main source of error in the projection of the shadow, because uh, they are known for very long a very short period since 1992, and the orbits are more than 200 years. So we do not have the observation to cover uh, an orbit, for instance. So when we project the orbits uh, further in the future, the, the uncertainty increases 
very quick. Also, these occultations are here, so it, it, they, they, they occur. When they occur, so because we, do not, we, we cannot select when we observed or where, and we have to wait for the object pass in front of the star. So they are here, depending on the region the, the object is located. If they are located close to the center, uh, passing in front of the center of the galaxy, for instance, they will have a larger density of stars, so it's, it's more common, but depending on the region, it's here. The occultations last for a few seconds or minutes, so if we have some problem in the observation, if you have clouds on the sky, we may lose the observation. This uh, occurs very frequently. Uh, the occultations can happen anywhere on Earth, so it can happen as well on, uh, on the Atlantic, here on the oceans, so we cannot move there to observe. And sometimes this involves a very bright stars. So it would be a very good observation if it was located, for instance, in the US or Europe, where we have a lot of observers. Uh, we need many observers spread over Earth, like if the occultation involves a body that is very large, the shadow will, will be very large. So if it is Pluto, for instance, that is, is occulting we have, we need to have observers spread over 2,000 kilometers to observe many of that, uh, what you call shorts, over the, the shadow. Uh, yeah, it's more likely the, the occultation also involves faint stars because the, main, the majority of the stars are faint. And for bright stars, which is very good when we have the occultation by bright stars, we do not need to use large telescopes because what we see is the star disappearance. So if we look at the bright stars, we we'll see they will disappear even if the object is not observable. Okay, uh, this is the our luck star team. Uh, this is the team that we do most of this work on the TNOs. There are other uh, groups that do this kind of work, but we are the lead on cell occultations. The, le uh, the, lead of, the leader of the group is Bruno Scardi, that is located a lot in, 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 in Paris in Observatoire de Paris. In the Hill, what you call the Hill Group, because it was formed in, the, in Rio de Janeiro, is led by Roberto Guerra Martins from the National Observatory and Felipe Braga Ribas from UTFPR, from Paraná. And we also have the Granada team in Spain, that is led by José Luis Ortiz. And all these people that shown here are the core team they work frequently on computations. Uh, it's not updated because, of course, he is um, uh, in Uberland right now. And Bruno, for instance, is a professor in Observatory de Palombo as well. So we have to update the page. But there are a lot of students as well that work with us. In the Hill group, there are about 20 people. And it is a shame that we have only few girls in the group uh, work with us. But yeah, this is the team, right? And it's an international collaboration. <coughs> and there is also other collaborators in other groups, but they are more sporadic. Um, oh, there, there is another question here. I don't know if you can see. Uh, what's the incident wavelength that gives the diffraction pattern in slide 11? That slide is uh, raising many questions. Okay, so this uh, this is just a model. Uh, is it visible? But uh, okay, this is not a diffraction pattern. So this is just the drop caused by the star, uh, the light of the star being blocked by the light of the, by the by the object. The diffraction I showed is this. Uh, this slide is also invisible wavelength. Obviously, we do not observe in one wavelength that we have a range of observation and wavelength, so it's integrated. 
but uh, what you observe is should be more or less like this but it's, it's very difficult uh, to observe why because when we make observations we have an exposure time for each observation and sometimes this observation lasts for a second and these occultations have a velocity that is about 20 kilometers per second so one observation one image would cover like from here you know, 60 to here so all this light would be resumed in one point when we observe excuse me um right that that's the pattern i I've talked about actually I missed the, the light number but the thing is what what is the uh, where does the radiation come from such that you know it's about the the wavelength of the order of 40 kilometers I mean where does that radiation come from exactly I don't know the I, I, I missed something the perhaps. For the, star. The, the radiation is for the star let me come back here this is what it had the light of the star that comes like this, this, uh, right. this is a ray that comes from the star, it's parallel, or we can imagine like a plane wave front, but, but, from the but, star that is being blocked by this object. So the, this star, it emits uh, a wave packet that, that contains like uh, radiation of the order of, with a wavelength of the order of 40 kilometers. That's like, mm, I don't no. know what's that. No. Yeah, because it, for for you to 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 diffract an, a big object like that, you should have a wavelength that's comparable, right? I've missed not something, not, perhaps. Not, not exactly, because what we have is just the Fresnel diffraction here is very small. That's because, that's why we don't we only see very small diffraction. Uh, this model is very detailed because it's a model. But uh, that's why we do not see here the Aerith pattern, for instance. When sometimes we can make some uh, observation that is uh, an asteroid, the one kilometer size that we block block. In these cases, we can see some uh, the diffraction is more important. But no, the, the radiation we is divisible. So the, what you have here is, is the integrated of uh, uh, the plane wavefront blocked by this object. I, I do not expect it to, to observe it this uh, wave, wavelength in the order of uh, 40 kilometers. Yeah, that, that, that's what struck me, right? Because you, you typically expect that the fraction arises whenever the, the wavelength of the scatterer is... A, well, where the size of the scatter is of the order of the wavelength. But uh, just out of curiosity, what is the, uh, the wave packet center at for a typical star to, to produce such a, such a pattern? Like, that's a really, uh, you say, an ideal mode, of course, but uh, what's the, what are the typical values of the wave packets, the center of the wave packets to spread, just out of curiosity, really? Wave packet? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I don't know if I understood exactly what's the question, but the wavelength is divisible for about 700 nanometers, and the the large the, the size of the wave band is about 300 nanometers, and yeah, so. What we have here is the Fresno diffraction, and sometimes, as we measure the size of this only one, I don't know, I don't remember how, how is the name of this, but this, the size of this wave, uh, uh, this sinusoidal pattern is about one kilometer. So this is what we can compute. Maybe we, we should move along and then you guys can discuss that later, maybe? Sure. Okay, so I talked about the Granada team. We have a lot of collaborators uh, on the world because we need to cover a larger region on Earth to observe. So most of them are on Europe and the US. We have some collaborators also in the New Zealand and Australia as you can see. 
In Brazil, we do not have many of the, uh, many collaborators. Most of these have collaborated sporadically, but uh, we have some. Made, the observations are made basically on uh, Itajubá, sometimes Rio, uh, Guaratinguetá, uh, São José dos Campos, Paraná, Santa Catarina, etc. So we have some in Brazil, uh, although we have a large region, we do not have many observers. Uh, that uh, available. So the main results that we can obtain from these characteristics, as we have talked already, size of the body and shape, that is basically because we measure the shape of the shadow. The density, if we know the mass and we have the shape, we can calculate the density of the body. Albedo, so the albedo is the, the ratio between the quantity of light uh, received by the sun uh, at the body and the quantity of light reflected by the body. So if the body is dark, it will reflect less than if it was uh, white or made of ice, for instance. So if you have the size, we can comp compute the, the albedo and estimate what the, how is the surface composition. If the, if the shadow presents some difference from the circular or ellipsoidal shape, we can constrain some topography as well, like craters and mount mountains. We can also have a, a very good position for the object because we can pinpoint, the, we, we know the, book, the, the position of the star, we know the position on Earth, the observed occultation, so we can pinpoint the exact position of the body. And also rotational phase, I'll come to that later on. And sometimes you can obtain as well binarity if the occultation happens twice in the same observation, or satellites, rings, or atmosphere, like I presented previously. Here is an example of an occultation that we discovered rings. So this is an occultation by Sharipla, observed in 2013. It was published in 2014 at, at Nature. What we had was Shariklo, which is a centaur that has two rings. It passed in front of a star. It was observed with this telescope in Chile. So when this the ring passed in front of the star, we had some drops, then the main body, and later the ring again. This observation by the Danish telescopes presented here. It was a very good observation with small noise. So we could see a small drop here and then three points of drop here. And these drops were symmetric. So with this, we could see that there was a ring around a shadow group. This was not the only observation because with two observations, one observation we could see that there is two things uh, symmetrically related to the body, but we had other observations spread that could show that it was really a ring and not some uh, small uh, quantity of dust, for instance, that was orbiting the object. This was a very important observation detection because previous to this detection, we only knew rings around the planets. And Shariklu has a size of about 400 kilometers. So this was the first ring discovered around a small object, which implies different physics and models to explain why these rings are present. Because it's, recent, it's easier to explain uh, rings around planets, but not so much around these small objects. This is another ring that was discovered in 2017 in Haumea. Haumea is a dwarf planet, and this observation was made here in Europe. It was published by Ortiz in 2017 in Nature as well. This was very interesting because, as I said, we knew the uh, rings in the planets, then in Chariklo, and now it was the first in the dwarf planet. In this case, Haumea is also characterized as an uh, elongated body, which is uh, very interesting to study the dynamics of rings uh, as well. 
And also we had a recent discovery by another ring. But this is about, uh, around Kawar, which is another dwarf planet. This was a much more difficult observation because as you can see here, the, these rings caused only small drops in the light curves, but we could see them. We can see that they are very uh, different in one side and the other. Here is narrower and here is more white and wider. So, the, so this, because of this, it was very difficult to observe this ring because we have observations of Kawa occultation since 2013, but the rings was discovered and detected only uh, last year. And it was submitted to Nature by my colleague, Bruno Morgat, and is uh, at the moment under embargo. An occultation by atmosphere, this is the occultation by Triton. So what happens in this case, as I said, the light of the the light of the star comes here and is refracted by the atmosphere and then it's con it converged to, a, to the center of the projection. And when we measure the light flux, we see like uh, this uh, the central flash. In this occultation uh, caused by Triton, what we saw was very interesting because here we can see that there is the, this, the drop is is smooth, there is not a quick drop. But when we have this convergence, we have a very interesting, uh, a very interesting set of flash because the quantity of light measured during the set of flash was very, was much, much, uh, was more, more, if I recall twice, the brightness of the star outside of the occultation. So what we see, let me re return here, this level here. So we have here Neptune, we have here Triton and the star. And here we measure the light of the star and Triton together. Then, then Triton pass in front of the star. So we have just a small light, but then the light flux will increase very quick and very bright. So we had twice the light uh, we have outside of the occultation. That's very interesting. So with this, it could characterize the atmosphere of Triton as a spherical atmosphere, a very, uh, uh, with, it was not very different in, 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 in longitude and latitude. It was very uniform. Topography, this is uh, another occultation that was had, uh, it was not a quick drop, but it was uh, yes, smooth. But in this case, we could not see uh, atmosphere there because there was other observations of the same occultation that did not present uh, smooth drops. And the immersion was very quick. So in, in this occultation by the TNO 2003-84, what we saw was topography in the body. So to characterize that, this uh, occultation happens in the limb, so in the very limit of the shadow. So what we, we what happened was that there was mountains, so the star blinked, the uh, star disappeared and reappeared many times. But since each point here is an integration during some time, we could not see the star disappearing many times. So the integration of the light during some time caused this small, uh, this drop like this. So what we projected was that uh, was two possible solutions, a chasm, like uh, two, 22 kilometers and 7.7 uh, 7 .7 kilometers deep, or a depression like this. So both uh, possible solutions given the light curve that was observed. We can observe binarity. binarity. This is an occultation made by IOTA, not our group. This is by the asteroid Antiope. So observing the occultation, there was some observers that saw drops in this region. Between some uh, observers, there was uh, some that observed 
a negative chord, so no drop in the star, and then all the observers they saw a drop. So when we combine that on space, we can see that there was two objects and not one. This is also what was observed uh, by the group of the MIT in this occultation from the, by Ahopat. So combining many occultations, we can see that there is like uh, two, two circles right here. So the, this is a binary object. And this is an object that was observed by the New Horizons spacecraft after he visited Pluto. So what he observed was this. So occultation really can, can obtain a very accurate shape of the body. Uh, another characteristic, this is an uh, occultation that I worked, is by the Hegel satellite Phoebe. What he had was, uh, in this work, I compared 3D models with the occultation observations. So this is the projected uh, phase or the rotational phase for the time of occultation. But in this case, since Phoebe is scattered, uh, given these chords, I could not fit very well the shape. So it could not be like this. Since this 3D model was obtained by Cassini, uh, the 3D model should be right, and the occultation is also right. So I should make some kind of uh, modifications in the model to obtain uh, a real fit. What I did was suppose an error in the rotation parameter, the rotational velocity. So I rotated it until I could find a match between the 3D model and my observations. So it is I could improve the velocity, uh, rotational velocity of the body. Okay, this is the main results by our group. So I'll just talk quickly, what am I currently working on? So right now I've been working on SORA. SORA is a software that we develop for analysis of stellar rotations. As you can see, there are a lot of things that can be done with uh, stellar rotations. And during the revolution of the technique, the, because the technique is not, is not new, it's observed since 1950s, uh, etc. But the evolution of the technique has improved because of precision. And, the, and our team had developed many packets to make the, the reduction. And each packet does something small. So it was very, it was a, a very uh, wide range of codes. It was not, uh, it was very difficult to work with stellar quotation previously to SOTA because it was very, it was very difficult to, to understand what each code did. So uh, in this work, we made a, a, a new software. We combine all this information it was not a direct translation of the previous code. We did it brand new, but it will do everything that we need for stellar quotation. So predictions, we obtain information from database, online database. We fit light curves and fit the shape. This is what it is done right, right now, but we had a, a, a lot to develop yet. So it's an improvement regarding previous softwares that were made mainly in Fortran. And sometimes we had to modify the code itself to add a parameter instead of providing input. It was very, very hard to, to work. And this code is open source since August 2021. And it was published in, in the monthly notes of Royal Astronomical Society in the beginning of this year. This for the initial version that we call uh, of SOL. It is an open source and open development package, so it is available on GitHub, so anyone can uh, enter, see the codes, uh, provide the suggestions, modifications, and we will analyze and improve or disprove the, these modifications. All the code is documented in, the, in this website, soar.bigadocs.io. Out the team that develops SORA is about six persons. 
So it, none of us are real developers or programmers. So we are learning a lot to make this code available to everyone. At the moment, the SORA is in the version 0.2.1. We have finished the development 0.3. There is to be published if we, if we probably next month. And in this case, we will include the analysis of occultations and 3D objects, 3D shape objects together, like with uh, I work with Phoebe, uh, the inclusion of rotational elements and modern star catalogs. Mainly. Uh, we also had some funding from the High Simons Foundation for the creation of occultation portal for the reduction of stellar occultations, where the scientific core uh, package is SORA. And this is being led by Rodrigo and Guga. And for the future implementations, we, we still have to do the analysis of rings and atmosphere, uh, uh, fit of multiple occultations simultaneously and also to study the star because when we have occultations it can also contain some features for the star the star can be binary can, the star can be white uh, etc so these are things that we need to develop yet but these are very uh, complex things uh, so they're not easy to to do and also uh, I think it's more interesting. We, I've been working with occultations to be observed by spacecraft. We already had one, which was an occultation by Kauer, that's shown here, observed by the telescope KELPS. KELPS is a telescope developed to observe uh, transits from exoplanets. But uh, we got some time to observe Kauer. It was a test, but we obtained the, this observation. So Kelps is orbiting the Earth like this, and you observe the occultation, the shadow imagined right here. And it was the first occultation by a telescope orbiting Earth that we predicted and observed by a satellite, artificial satellite. Because there was another observations before, but it was with planets, so that the shadow is very large. Or it was a occasional observation, it was not predicted. So this is the first one that we predicted and observed. And this publication, uh, this observation was published. In fact, it's accepted for publication and I'm the third author. Okay, so with this observation, we already made some new predictions. And this is, uh, we submitted some requests for time with this telescope. I'm the principal investigator. Uh, I did the predictions. We had already 7.5 hours approved. This is a lot because, but uh, this for this kind of observation, they approved by orbits. So uh, we obtained five orbits of observation, and each orbit is 1.5 hours. So this means five observations, five occultations that we can observe. However, the position of the satellite is not very, uh, it's not very good because uh, they, they suffer from the, the variations in the gravity field of Earth. So they have to be constantly uh, made maneuvers to correct the orbit. So because of this, we cannot have a good prediction for the future. But we know that they are kept in this orbit like this, so we can make statistical prediction and in this case, we estimated that there is 20% probability of Kelps to observe this occultation by Triton. This will happen in a month and a half. So we are already uh, starting preparations for this observation. And also there are four other occultations that will be happen next year. And also for the prediction of occultations by James Webb, uh, James Webb is a telescope, that is, but it's not orbiting Earth. It's 1.2 million kilometers uh, far from Earth. We have this project, which the principal investigator is Pablo Sanzst from, from, from the Granada group. So he obtained about 2.2 hours, 
to observe with, with James Webb. It is the kind of target of opportunity. So in this case, we do not provide the occultations itself. So we, uh, we provide only the project and we had many object, objects and some of them will be uh, observable. So we are uh, improving the predictions in realizing uh, every week and every or every two weeks, uh, making the predictions because the same way as Kelps, the James Webb orbit is always updating. So we have to correct the position of the satellite to observe the occultations. So we make these predictions to look what is the best occultation that we can uh, observe. So when we select these occultations, two weeks prior to the observation, we ask for the time that we will be obtained between these 2.2 hours. Okay, so this characterizes the target of opportunity. So yeah, I think that's it for what I had to talk. It was an hour. I'm sorry if it was too long. It was, uh, it was right in time. Uh, thank you very much for this very nice talk. Uh, which is open to, to questions now. Huh? We had a couple of questions already. If you want to open your microphone and ask directly. Uh, Jomir has, uh, I think you can read it yourself. Yeah, the quotation process seems to be very effective by load. Yes and no. The, it appeared the paint of the object. We already had uh, predictions that was very precise. For instance, this is a prediction for the stellar rotation of Triton. The uncertainty was about 16 million seconds, which is about, uh, uh, let's remember, I think 300 kilometers. So mostly just, it was very small compared to the size of the, the shadow because Triton is observed, uh, uh, is known for a very long time. So it's all this very, uh, it's very accurate. So because of this, we already know the, the path of the shadow, although the very limit of the shadow can have a, a small error. In the case of Phoebe, for instance, the uncertainty was about the, the size of the body. So in this case, could be, uh, we can say there was a little bit luck to observe. I did not show here when we do campaigns, when we have an uncertainty, that we call for many observers to be spread over this region. So we cover a lot uh, of the possible uh, region of the shadow. So to guarantee that at least one uh, observer can, can get uh, a reputation. Any more, any more questions? I think Edson, uh, is, uh, Edson always asks uh, questions, but uh, Edson yeah. is there. Yeah, Edson is there. Uh, okay, nice, nice talk. Thank you for for your presentation. Um, and my question is, uh, it's like more practical, I would say. So, uh, New York, just want to understand how how do you proceed, how you 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 do your research essentially. So, you typically have to go to this uh, to the uh, lab to take the the data. And, and and make and perform the analysis or you have this data somewhere you can you can just download and and, and analyze, analyze them yeah so what we do uh let me just show another presentation instead of this well what we do like as i said we have uh, we have a, a lot of observations they are made for many objects for many observers, and then we ask them for we ask them for these observations. Usually, they are uh, images or videos, and we put them in some cloud. Or we have in our group we have some databases in Rio de Janeiro and in France where we put them. But when we work with these occultations itself, when we, I work with one occultation, I download all these observations and work on my computer. What I do is compute the light of the star for each image and then obtain the, the light curve. I, 
don't know if I have more things here that I can show. So, okay, I, I, thought, I thought there was something here. So I have this, these observations, I make this uh, analysis of, the, of all these images. Sometimes I work with 15 gigabytes, sometimes it can be as much as 100 gigabytes. It will depend on the number of observations uh, in, this, in some cases. In this occultation that we had here, we had about 80 observers, so there was a lot of data. It was a thesis for, uh, for a French student, but in this case here, for instance, it was two observations, so it was uh, four gigabytes. So it would depend on the, on the, on the data. Uh, 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 what what the the important importance of uh, artificial intelligence to to uh, analyze the, the, this uh, huge amount of data and sometimes typically you have is, is that useful? Well, some yeah uh, we we do not use uh, artificial intelligence just because well first because none of our group uh, is are very known to this technique, but uh, it's very difficult, even with the techniques that we have, to to obtain these uh, occupations, because each observer sends some kind of data that is very different from each other. Uh, as I said, sometimes in video, sometimes in in fits, that is the format that we usually work. Sometimes in PNG. Sometimes the time of the occultation is printed in the metadata, and sometimes in the image, and the object moves. There, there is a, a very large uh, samples uh, of observation that we can work. And there are many steps that must be done. And the first one is this that I, that I showed, the, the photometer where we measure the light for all observations. Perhaps here I can imagine it more easily uh, uh, artificial intelligence, but then the analysis of the occultation itself is more difficult because each 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 each, each object, each occultation is very different for for each other. Is very it requires different uh, kind of analysis. As I said, uh, I worked with three D uh, models, but in some other works. They didn't have 3D models, but, but had uh, some craters that, that was presented. Present. So, in the analysis of the occultation, uh, at the moment, I cannot imagine using uh, artificial intelligence. Okay, thank you. There is a question here from. Sorry, uh, there is a question here from the staff. Uh, how occultation can review information about exoplanets? Okay, so exoplanets are different. Uh, when uh, the technique I show here is for solar system bodies, so when we see the star is very far and the object is very near, so the size of the star, the apparent size of the star compared to the body, is very small. So, like uh, the apparent size of the star projected the distance of the body would be about one kilometer, and the body has four, so it's a very small. Uh, so we can see the light of the, the star being blocked completely, completely. When we have exoplanets, the, the object is close to the star, so when you occult the star, it's a very small uh, area of the star that is blocked. So when we have light curves, uh, and it is not called occultation, it's called trans, when we have light curves, uh, it would be about 2% drop, or uh, less than that. So it's very difficult to observe. I do not have, uh, I do not have uh, curves for exoplanets. I will try to, to find something that could be related, but I do not have any. So yeah, exoplanets are more difficult because uh, the magnitude drop, the light drop is about 1%, sometimes less than that because the area of the star that is being covered by the planet is very small. Okay. 
Okay, any, any more questions? Uh, apparently not, but uh, thank you very much, Altair, for, uh, I think, Edson? A bell with Zé Maria is right, something. Um, oh. oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Well, very nice presentation. I, uh, we, the whole uh, department, uh, the institute welcomes you. It's very nice to have an astronomer in the group. So uh, we look forward to having other presentations by yourself.